Achtung, Achtung. Welcome to We Have Ways of Making You Talk with me, Al Murray, and of course, James Holland. And uh, James and I are speaking to a very special guest today. Who have we got, Jim? Well, we've got someone uh, I've um, actually been uh, hoping to speak to for quite a long time, and I'm very thrilled that we're now finally doing it. It's Dr. Gajendra Singh, who is a historian down at Exeter University and who's done an incredible amount of work on Indian soldiers in the two world wars. But obviously, this being about the Second World War, it's the Second World War bit that I'm particularly interested in. I'm I'm assuming you are as well now. But, um, um, and you've done a lot on the testimonies of Indian soldiers, which I'm very interested in Gajendra because I've spent a lot of time trying to get oral testimonies of Indian soldiers in the Second World War and I'm not going to lie I've not got a huge huge distance with it Um, I've interviewed maybe two or three Indian soldiers who served in the Second World War and it's nothing like enough and and I find it really difficult because if you want to write a book about any aspect of the Burma campaign or Imphal, Kahima, all those sort of things, you know, how do you get those voices, those Indian voices, where are they? And I've put out feelers all around India and I've got absolutely nowhere. Well, welcome. Anyway, after that, <laughs> after that, after that, uh, <laughs> that mo- moany intro. <laughs> well, I'm not trying to sound moany. I'm, I'm sad about no, it. I just, you know, I mean, you know, you know perfectly well. You know, you can get yeah. any number of of Tommies from, you know, the Durham Light Infantry or the West Kents or whatever it might be, or paratroopers. No, no problem with voices, voices on that. But getting Indian voices, and when you think of the huge proportion of Indian troops in the Indian Army and in 14th Army in the Second World War, you're doing them a disservice by not including them. But what can you do? And it go and it goes beyond that because the formations, like say Fourth Indian Division, commanded by Francis Tuca, they may have a British bloke in charge. But basically, the body of stuff about it is in India. is 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 absent from the from a British angle. Anyway, welcome, Gajendra. Thanks for joining us. No, no, it, it, it's a pleasure to be here, and um, I think you know that initial discussion is a very good one. Um, I think there are analogies to what is there elsewhere. I think in many ways, Britain is unique in some respects because there was um, a great social history project in order to try and preserve as many voices as possible from 1960s, uh, particularly by uh, the IWM. That which occurs um, in and regards the Indian Army is there, for instance, if you want to uh, talk about West African soldiers, yeah, whether they're uh, the Bayer Senegalese or um, the West African Frontier Force. It's not unique in terms of a colonial setting. It does, however, speak to the position of colonial soldiering in the post-colonial mind where in India, certainly, there was a great deal of embarrassment about this kind of presence of people who were, after all, essentially uh, colonial policemen, at least in the initial guise. Um, It's also about partition as well, um, that uh, you have this um, event, what is, um, at least by UN standards, a genocide that occurs in 1947, uh, a huge dismantling of that structure of what was the colonial Indian army, which is itself being partitioned uh, from 1946, and where you have a, um, a real kind of loss of the support structures uh, that were in place you know, for uh, pension soldiers in particular, uh, what in India were uh, district soldiers boards, um, who would provide, who hand out the pensions, but also be the people who would try and maintain contact uh, with former soldiers. Um, It's not to say that those voices aren't there, but they aren't there in the same sense as occurs in Britain as a state-led exercise or a state-led as much as it was done through the IWM, which is uh, operating through the ages of the state. So you've got the the competing problems of of basically, because after all, in the UK, war service is regarded as virtuous, is regarded as... Uh, 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 you know, cent- culturally centrally a good thing, isn't it? Second World War service and the states backing, preserving those memories. Whereas in India, you've got two things working against it, I- I- in essence. Yeah. The absence of yeah. the state and the fact that, you know, war service is seen after the war as, as compromised <laughs> with, 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 the, uh, with the birth of two new countries. True, true. But, but then what I would say, though, is that by British standards, Second World War was exceptional in that respect. Uh, because the idea of any war being a good war um, is unusual. We I mean, compare it really. The Napoleonic War is a good example, yeah. Where what was the reaction uh, for returned soldiers, yeah, in Britain at that time? 
uh, it was quite the opposite what happened. Even the First World War, if you're looking at those early early Remembrance Day parades right through the 1920s, often you have riots in Britain cities here uh, as uh, as pedestrian soldiers would turn up here and sort of contest this trivialization of their of their service or uh, complain about uh, their treatment in uh, post-war British society. So I think it's um, the position of the war in Second World War in Britain is exceptional in many respects. And I know in Britain, we sort of tend to be a very sort of Anglo-centric lens, I think. But other than with um, Soviet Russia, there's not the same kind of preoccupation elsewhere. There's also then problems with the idea of colonial soldiering as well, particularly when it comes to uh, the other ranks. You never really had um, a firm grasp of uh, who was there, or particularly a firm grasp of uh, who was enlisting at certain points, um, particularly from 1942 onwards, as you have this massive expansion of the Indian Army, there's a real dependency on people who aren't necessarily seen as friendly to uh, the British to find recruits. So what you're having is um, quite a large infiltration by the Communist Party of India, which is, of course, made legal um, as soon as Barbarossa happens. You have lots of communist cells appearing in the Indian Army. There's huge reliance upon the Muslim League as well. The Muslim League um, is unlike the National Congress, is supporting the war effort and therefore is using it to recruit to, 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 to itself, um, um, grow and expand. You're having the presence of various political movements um, uh, who are creating militias in India, preparing for you know, in the run-up to partition, which is being planned in various forms uh, from the late 1930s, who are then you know, enlisting in order to gain military experience, not necessarily for British war effort, but for other alternative uh, agendas. Um, all of that complicates this idea, even, even, if, even if the British and Indi the British Raj had lasted longer, it would have still had been difficult you know, to actually fully map uh, who was present and age in that same process of collecting those oral testimonies, I think. But before the um, before the kind of sort of massive expansion, 1942 onwards, you know, the Indian Army really is a colonial police force, isn't it? And and the vast majority are from, not all by any stretch of imagination, but a large part of them are from, from, from northern India rather than central or southern India. But, but once you get to the expansion, you know, really are drawing from Indians all throughout the whole subcontinent. And that's a difference. And I know uh, something that Rob Lyman has argued in his recent book is that that you know actually Indians were from from all across India were were signing up because this was their ticket to independence and getting rid of the Raj and you don't want to get rid of the Raj and then have an even worse despot in charge in the in the Imperial Japanese so in a way it's a kind of a, it's a war for their own independence but has then been obviously overshadowed by partition or is that a, an oversimplistic view of looking at it. No, I think it's um it's quite a good one. That Indian army up until the very end, nineteen forty one, uh, when you're getting Japanese sort of entering the war through uh, Hong Kong, Hong Kong was the eighth of December, nineteen forty one, I think. Um, but the beginning of um that sort of very rapid Japanese advance to Southeast Asia, the Indian army it's not quite just a colonial police force in the sense that it is Indocentric. It's it is a colonial police force through um um through that Asiatic space, uh, through the Indian Ocean space, um, and into uh, North Africa as well, and into the Middle East here. It, it, that was its main function. But if you're looking at some initial British war planning, for instance, uh, that British expeditionary force in France is meant to be joined by an Indian expeditionary force. It was meant to be a similar plan to uh, the First World War. That's why you have very early detachments of Indian soldiers at Dunkirk, for instance, uh, Force K6, who were from the Mule Transport Corps. That's simply because they didn't have that kind of soldiering apparently in the Indian Army necessary to have Mule Transport uh, in Northern France, and therefore that's why they ended up going first. But they were meant to be joined, or meant to be the first attachment of an Indian expeditionary force. Um, so there was that sense of, you know, trying to tap into. Um, uh, that Indian reserve, I suppose, uh, even as very early, even before the like Second World War, really, uh, when war planning um, is is happening and uh, running a pace. What really complicates things is um, when you're having 
that Japanese advance through Southeast Asia is, I think, that rapid collapse of empire, the position that has in the British mind, British colonial mind in particular. You're having uh, the Royal Navy pull out of the Indian Ocean. You're having uh, India very much seen as being uh, by itself. Uh, you're having a real lack of officers in the Indian Army, and by which, so in those early years of the Second World War, there was a, a desperate desire to maintain a European officer uh, corps, was Indian Army. You had had in a couple of stages during the interwar period uh, a thing called Indianization of officers, um, um, but that was still restricted to certain regiments uh, of the Indian Army. Uh, what's happening as early early years of the war is as this army is growing, you need officers. They try and grant emergency commissions to uh, Europeans, tend to be uh, British people in India, uh, but they tend to make for very poor officers because they're seen to be prone to drink and unfit and that kind of stuff. Uh, so what you're getting is a need to find officers who are Indian. And then that's what you're, where you're having this for the British, it's not what they want, for the, British, for the British in India in particular, for the colonial establishment in India, not necessarily what they want, but you have this real reliance upon that communities which are seen to be problematic, uh, politically problematic, because they were sympathetic towards uh, nationalist causes. But as you're getting into that period, though, of the late 1930s, everyone is. Right? The idea that, that the nationalist cause in India was a, a, a preserve of a narrow minority is just not true. I mean, everyone is. And if you talk about this later, perhaps, but even a very, very low ranked Indian soldiers are talking about nationalist concerns in the Second World War, which is quite different uh, to the First World War. Um, so it really comes down to officers here. Yeah? And you're having a, a completely different kind of leadership appearing. Um, those people who end up as uh, the first CNC of the post Indian Army, um, um, who's a brigadier by the end, uh, Karyapar, for instance, um, he ended up in the Second World War sort of leading the British occupation forces in Japan very briefly before uh, independence. Uh, but Karyapar, you know, he is reputed to have been very polite and uh, very fusive when in front of British officers. But certainly, certainly in the very statements I read of him outside that would, would swear at these at these, at these, at these, uh, at really? these uh, 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 damned Ferengi. Ferengi is a term for European or foreigner in general. And I, I think that um, that kind of attitude was not uncommon in terms of this kind of professional Indian officer that you're beginning to get here, the sense of the army being an early part of a nation in being or a nation that's yeah. emerging uh, is quite important. I think. But you think that is, that is part of it? That is part of what's going on? Yeah, absolutely. The only thing I'd say, though, is that there's a substantive pro-Japanese element as well, right? It's not just the case that it's... Um, it's about fighting against Japan because Japan is definitely about worse than the British. It's there's a you know, there's a rebel army that comes into being. Yeah, yeah, cool. Uh, uh, that is, um, and everything. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, that is collaborating with the Japanese. And if you're getting into that, um, it's important not just to think about the Second World War period itself. Um, what, what's happening afterwards is that there is an attempt to um, hang these men. Uh, for waging war against the king, which was the king emperor. After the Second World War, um, when you're having those INA trials happen, uh, what, you're having, what, what happens is that um, because of the scale of protests in Indian civil society, um, the, the initial three men who are tried have to be pardoned, even though they're found guilty. Uh, you're having massive mutinies break out in the Indian Army, in the Royal Indian Air Force, and also uh, the Royal Indian Navy. And mutinies here um, in the Navy, leading to the shelling of some ships here in Karachi Harbor, the red flag being raised in Bombay, loss of control of Bombay for four days. I mean, it, it, it is quite a severe kind of uh, event. And the trigger, in part, not in whole, is um, these INA trials. So I'm always like, a, I always love this of quote here by Ochenleck at the end of the Second World War when he's trying to uh, talk about the reason as to why uh, the INA trials have to be, why a pardon has to be issued. 
uh, for these men. He sort of talks about the idea that we have to recognize that these soldiers had no real loyalty to us as we understand loyalty. And I think it's quite a good, uh, <laughs> uh, um, quite a good concept, I think. That's that's fast that that's that's fascinating. So, it, it, I mean, just as just as military service in the UK sort of forms part of you know, there's there's ex- lots of debate about the Kharki election after all, and the and the, the the creation of the welfare state is a direct sort of byproduct of military service. So that that's part of the birth of the Indian nation story, and although complicated again by partition, because you're not talking about one country coming into existence, are you? After all. So that so the all the factionalism you're that's in the pot that's being stirred, because as you say, you've got the um uh uh the, the the Muslim end of things, so that they they're they're doing it politically to oppose Congress, to show Congress up, to show willing, and to make their their hand stronger to negotiate when 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 independence comes, right? Um. So yeah, but yeah, you're right. In, as much as you, it, it's both about the nation of Pakistan and India. For the Muslim League, it's not about showing up Congress. Uh, the Muslim League, uh, at the very start of Second World War, was still um, a regional force rather than an all India force. Um, so um, its sort of power base sort of tends to be in um, what's now Uttar Pradesh, the United Provinces, and of the north central India, the Gangetic Plain. Um, supporting the war effort is just a handy way of. Um, allowing yourself to propagandize, right? Uh, uh, free of 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 um, of any interference for the first time. So it, 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 what you're having is a massive growth of the Muslim League. Likewise, you're also having a massive growth of the Communist Party of India as well for similar reasons. Yeah, and um, uh, whereas Indian Congress does the opposite, you know, you're having uh, active opposition uh, towards uh, um, the British Raj, towards the continuance of the Indian Empire uh, during the Second World War. So it is about strategic development of the Muslim League. And certainly by the end of the Second World War, when you have elections occurring, the Muslim League can present itself here as an all-India force, as a, a pan-Indian movement, which it couldn't even in 1941, 1942. Right. Well, so so the, the war is excellent political leverage, basically. Um, yeah, so but but I think I think the, the the point though is right is that when it comes to sort of these nationalist movements, um, or even the Communist Party of India, for instance, the idea that the Indian Empire is coming to an end, right? The British are it, it's not seen as a question. It, it, it's regarded as a fact, right? We know it's going to happen. So it's about what forms the future state will take, uh, and that's re- is really this jostling of position, uh, and also you're having a kind of a fragmentation to a certain extent of the National Congress's hegemony over, um, uh, over this sort of nationalist movement. By the Second World War, by 1940s, the central sort of leadership of the Congress are of a certain age. Um, if they, they've been imprisoned quite a lot, you know, which uh, takes its toll. By the end of the Second World War, the party structure of Congress has been completely smashed uh, as a result of... Um, uh, the sort of last great push for independence that happens in 1942. It's called the Quit India campaign. Um, so um, it's very much about sort of imaginaries of what future state will, 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 will be there. Just as so I think you, uh, you can um, imagine sort of ideas of, you can fantasize about military service here from a position of empire loyalism, so you can also fantasize about military service from the position of wanting to impose empire, right? It's very useful uh, if, if you're imagining a, a, um, opposition towards empire to have men who have military training. And that leads to a very dark side of things as well, right? Particularly when it comes to petition violence in Punjab, where you have a very large number of former soldiers. Uh, it explains uh, the very high death toll of killings in Punjab. Yeah, because when you're having men who have military training, they're able to enact and orchestrate uh, violences that are on a different scale uh, to those who don't. Yes, yeah. Yeah. Gosh. Yes. Um, <laughs> it's absolutely fascinating. So, so, um, and where do you go then to get to, to, 
to find accounts to find people's testimony. Well, where, that was going to be because, exactly my next because, question. Because, because that, that, that's, that's where we started. And we've sort of, we've kind mm. of painted this political, <laughs> p- political picture, which is, I mean, uh, and cultural picture, which is incredibly complex. Um, although with this, th- I mean, it's fascinating, the through line that independence is, go- is coming. There's no, it's not a, it's not, it's a, not a question of if, it's a question of when and how, isn't it? Is yeah. the, it's the thing that's that's hanging everything. So, so these testimonies, where do you where do you find these, and what do they tell you? Um, so, in terms of uh, the stuff I use, like World War, um, uh, I found stuff like by accident. It's always useful, and I found some stuff that I thought might exist. In terms of the accidental stuff, uh, there's a thing. There's a, a particular a military sensor imposed upon Indian soldiers active in. Um, Middle East, uh, North Africa, and parts of Italy, Cyprus as well, uh, called Middle East Military Censorship, uh, which is sort of active. Middle East? Life. It's MEMC, Middle East Military Censorship. Yeah. This, this is what it's called. It, it's just a, it, it, because you're, you have various censorship authorities. This is the one I know that still survives. Yeah, it wasn't meant to. So in the reports, it, it just gives you sort of, um, uh, Mission Impossible style advice that, about how to destroy <laughs> this report. Yeah. <laughs> um, 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 so it wasn't meant to survive. That, that it survived was an accident. I think it's because it was misfiled. In terms of where that exists, um, it exists in the British Library because the British Library contains the papers of the India office. It ended up uh, in the India office and just ended up being filed away. And it's, it is actually misfiled, but it still exists. Now, that contained, as all censorship reports contain, uh, weekly and then fortnightly updates uh, from the censor, including sort of sometimes lengthy extracts, sometimes quite short extracts uh, of um, the letters they've looked at. Um, so that was one method. It's quite interesting. Um, certainly for the time it was, because it goes from 1941 to 1944-ish uh, uh, in various, it's not complete, so you get various sort of snapshots. Um, the other was something that uh, at the time, I suspected might exist, but I didn't quite know. Um, what you had was the C stick had an Indian equivalent, the C stick I, um, and when it came to um, that sort of Nazi hunting organization in India, uh, it was very much looking towards uh, potential Indian collaborators. Yeah, with um, so yes, you do get internment of. Uh, German or Japanese citizens to some extent, but it's um, looking potent- really at potential uh, Indian um, collaborators with Germany and also then Japan. Uh, C stick an organization that take charge of trying to round up as many individuals as they can who were involved in uh, the Azad Hind thought, which was the Army of Free India, was often referred to as the Indian National Army. Uh, that organization that was a rebel army. Uh, uh, who, who, who fought with the Japanese um, uh, in particular 1944. Um, so they managed to sort of track down 17,000. Um, there's another about 15,000 or so that slipped through uh, back into India. And they interrogate 9,000 before they give up, basically. Because by the time they go to 9,000, you go into 1946, the game's up you know, when it comes to uh, uh, liberation India. So it, it tends just to be wound up after that. And that's, it's quite an interesting thing, really. Uh, so you, where you get our interrogation reports. Um, and the, the, they are sort of fascinating sources, really. Of course, the interrogations, of course, it's it's C stick. So it's not necessarily always voluntary interrogations. Uh, you do have various reports by people suggesting that they were being tortured. Um, it's probably likely. Um, it's certainly um the case that people could be quite harshly treated people were dying in custody you know but that was the nature uh, of the of the enterprise so uh, that was the main thing i used um i also used a few interviews the, the problem with oral interviews is simply that particularly at the time in which we're living we're living at the wrong time to do it um because e- even when i was doing that so I, I in particular was trying to interview people involved in the ina so I knew the guy who was involved in, who was the head of INA intelligence. He still had some kind of network of people. But when you're getting people in their 80s and 90s, it, what you, you get is it's the, it's the stock response. Like, oh, it's a long time ago when I was a young man then. Yeah. I think that um, even if you find people who are alive and who you can talk to, 
um, there's that thing that that was one point in your life. It becomes a difficult thing, uh, even if you want to try and recover that testimony. I often think that you know, if you're 30 years earlier, then perhaps you could um, gain something more worthwhile. We need to take a break right now. We'll see you in a tick. Welcome back to We Have Ways of Making You Talk. I remember when I was talking to, I mean, I was talking to Indian veterans. They were Indians who subsequently moved over to UK and, and lived in, you know, various parts of parts of Britain. Um, and so at the time I was interviewing, they were in there, you know, the guy, one guy I particularly remember, he was an engineer, he was in the, ended up in the engineers in 4th Indian Division in, and he was at the Battle of Alamein and, you know, all through North Africa. And, you know, recruiting sergeants came around and, you know, he thought, well, I'm newly married. I've got a young wife. You know, this sounds like a bit of possibility. So he then walked, I don't know, wherever he was, something like 20 miles to the nearest town where there was a recruiting officer signed up. And that was it. He was off, you know, and he basically, I think he came back, said goodbye to his wife and didn't see her again for two and a half years or something. And, um, and he was just incredibly kind of phlegmatic about it. It was just sort of, you know, it was something to do. It was, you know, there wasn't much work at home and, Seemed like an opportunity and learn some skills and blah, blah, blah. Old-fashioned you know, soldierly reasons for joining an army, in fact. Completely old-fashioned, but there was, there, was, there was not even a whiff of any politics in it at all, neither pro-Raj, no, neither pro or against, pro-INA or against, you know, it was, just, it, was, it was just completely kind of neutral about it. It was, it was something that was happening. It seemed an opportunity. He took it. He had no regrets, but... You know, it was what it was. But it's just one example out of millions. No, no, no. no. Yeah. Uh, 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 the, the best story I've come across is um, uh, a person who said that um, that uh, they sort of saw a line and their mate was in the line, so they joined the queue. And it kind of makes a big sense in a way, right? It's because it seems like a fun thing to do. So, um, um, But also um, kind of 19-year-olds and 20-year-olds are feckless. Absolutely. They? Well, well, here's the thing. They're well, often, feckless, they're just sort of uh, naive uh, 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 and it, kind of, you know, what do you know? You, you're getting boys as young as 14 in this thing in India. Yeah. So it's it, even, even younger than 19 and 20, yeah? Um, well, uh, I, I know my my grandfather enlisted in the para in Indian Paris, nineteen forty four, and then and, then, and, and he did it because like it sounded really cool, and then and then, and then my great grandfather <laughs> came up and said look, look, he, no 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 you're not doing it, <laughs> I just I, and he used a friend of his to get his name to score it off, yeah, um, but but I think I think fundamentally when it comes to soldiering everywhere, it's about wage labor, right? Um, it, it, it it's a way. To gain good wage, gain good living, and also to gain, as you said, skills. Day. Also skills, right? Um, this is why, yeah, yeah, this is why people want to sort of join engineers or signals because you know it's um it, it, it's skills. Prestige is important though, um, but 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 it's prestige in terms of what it enables you to do afterwards, right? And then of course there's there's things that maybe we necessarily sort of talk about, which is we have fantasies of soldiering, but it's also necessarily the fantasies that we necessarily think about. It's often about sex, really. That I can go, I can, I can go, I can go somewhere, and I can pick up a cool woman, right? Or, or I've heard, you know, that soldiers have a great deal of fun in, in some in, you know, That's that's what young men talk about. So um, that's certainly there. By Second World War, I think it's it, it's the space that soldiering occupies that enables sort of forms of political education. Partly, it's because what soldiering is Second World War. Um, you you need to have a level of learning and expertise beyond what you once did. Um, the literate soldier is quite highly prized. Uh, the Indian Army, Second World War in particular, even my First World War, uh, is taking great pains to try and uh, educate soldiers. Um, um, and that process of education, that that process of becoming. Um, not just literate, but also literary enough to, to begin to read newspapers, to begin to understand what's going on. Um, the fact that um, you gain a sense as a soldier of India in a way you weren't necessarily going to gain a sense of. What I mean by that is that you know you're, you're going, you're enlisting, you're doing your training, you're then getting posted to various parts of India. You're seeing 
a sense of a nation. Uh, you're conversing with people from different parts uh, of the subcontinent, but also beyond that, right? You're, you're going to other parts of the world yeah, and talking to other soldiers. Yeah. Uh, and I think there is this kind of educative role. It's definitely there in the British Army, Second World War. Yeah. It's also there in other armies. Um, but- but but India's also in a different position than it's ever been in before strategically, isn't it? Because it's actually threatened. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and, that, that, and invaded, that, that's, right. yeah. And invaded, yeah. And absolutely, that's radically absolutely. different to, to any imperial role the Indian armies had before. Absolutely. And there's a point, I think, um, uh, James, we made earlier, um, we sort of talked about the idea of uh, a national accessibility to defend India. That's definitely there. When you get into... Middle East, mid century, the, the soldiers from Middle East, they're talking about this a lot. That like, why the hell are we fight in North Africa you know, when the Japanese are there? Yeah, like, right. there is the, there, there is there is this thing. But but, but, but also um, you've got this thing of, of uh, you know, I mean, nowhere else in the in in the world are are two armies defeated in the field, except in Burma and Northeast India, and four out of five of those soldiers that are doing that defeating are Indian. So you know it's it's or, or or certainly you know from the subcontinent they're not they're not British. I mean I think it's I think it's one in ten is British in 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 fourteenth army. You know so so the vast you know the hard yards of that victory at in in, in Fal and Kahima, which after all over here has been voted Britain's greatest battle ever in terms of the victory and what was achieved and the turnaround and all that kind of stuff. And the subsequent reconquest of Burma was done by Indian troops, not British troops. It might have been commanded by British generals, but but it was Indian hard yards that, that did the work. And that's no small achievement when they're not playing that role in 1942. You know, in, in, in two and a half years, two years, three years, they've you know, that's a, that's a hell of a turnaround. And, and, you know, the Japanese are no pushovers either, you know, so, so it's quite an achievement. It's not a major thing in a, a nationalist imaginary. It's certainly not a major thing that occurs in soldiers' voices that I've seen and come across. The, the, the main thing that, that, that's occupying the mind of soldiers in 1943, 1944 is uh, starvation, famine in Bengal. Um, uh, I think that, that there's other things that are happening in India beyond... Because bear in mind you know, that even in the Indian sense, those of the northeastern states, that kind of frontier with, with, with Burma, is quite distant in some respects here yeah, uh, from an Indian metropole, from Indian heartland. Yeah. Um, whereas when you're getting famine in Bengal, when you're having three million dying from a largely man-made famine, um, that strikes home in a way. Right? It, 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 and what you're getting is this... You know, uh, um, quite fascinating, quite heart-rending accounts here of moving through Bengal and seeing people die of starvation and then writing home, yeah, are you okay? Right? Do you need more money? This is what's occupying the mind of soldiers here. And then you get the other side of things because there were also uh, two Indian divisions of the INA um, active here, which is that aspect as well. We know that there were Indians fighting against Indians here. And um, I have accounts from the other side of things, from the INA side of things, yeah, about how they, what they, what they made of this. And you've got the Sir Chandra Bose airport to Calcutta. Well, yeah, quite. Well, but then, so uh, we can call, talk about Sebastian the Bose, I think, as well, uh, because I think that the one thing that um, in the Indian side of things yeah, is perhaps not talked about so much is the fact that um, he was quite openly a fascist, really. Yes. And you know, the, 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 there was a which fascist... Which is why it's so ironic that, you know, in Bengal, which is so traditionally kind of um, um, more political than other parts of India and and kind of more left-wing, isn't it? I mean, that's... that's, a, that's historically, what perhaps. Right. Historically. Not necessarily historically. now. No, 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 but historically. But then, but then, but then, but then I, 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 I and think... And then you have the that... Chibra yeah. I, I, I think so. Um, I think that comes partly about how we kind of theorize sort of fascist political thought here, yeah, in that we sort of think about it as this sort of interwar European phenomenon. Whereas when it comes to sort of Marxist, you know, communistic thought, we're ready to, ready to accept its international dimensions. With fascist thought, we, we are really perhaps reluctant to do that here yeah, in an odd way. But if you're getting in, if you're getting into those early reports by British intelligence, C-Stick, um, they are amazed in the early years of the war how much 
how many German publications are there in India? Um, um, and you having this reception, yeah, you're having this reception of fascist German thought from a very early stage in the mid 1930s. Wow. Uh, even Sebastian Le Bus, uh, he writes a text in the mid 1930s called The Indian Struggle. I mean, it doesn't take a genius if you read it and you compare it to yeah, my yeah, account. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, it's a very clear genealogy. The problem is, is that with Sebastian Le Bus is that he occupies this mind of a nationalist imaginary of this of great lost leader. So uh, he's sort of seen this prism of an anti-colonial cause rather than connected to uh, European fascisms. Although within people in Congress, Eduardo Nero, for instance, he's a no doubt this guy's a fascist yeah, from 1939. He's been condemned by it and about it uh, in the National Congress. Sebastian Bose is accusing Eduardo Nero of being too friendly to European Jews. They're, this is the kind of conversations that are occurring. But, um, the, but, the, but, but with nationalism, there is always that kind of the, the potential for that sort of nativist uh, yes. fascist thing to enter the picture, isn't there? So it's not a surprise, really, he's, no, that, that he's receptive no, to those no, ideas, is it? No, but, 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 it, but it, it doesn't fit into... The, the imaginary, yeah, it doesn't fit to the imaginary of the state as it wants to see itself after the Second World War. Yeah. yeah, yeah, of course not. Yeah, when it comes to the opinions of British intelligence uh, in India, they're not always virtuous, but on this, there's a very good reason as to why there was concern uh, about. There's a very good reason as to why Sebastopolis was interned in the very, the very start of the Second World War. It's because he was seen as a potential collaborator uh, with. Um, with the enemy, right? Particularly with, with Germany. That's what turned out. That had, that turned out that's what's going to, that's what did happen. So, um, yeah. I wonder what would have happened to him if he hadn't died in that plane crash. Yeah, it's interesting. So uh, he was trying to get to um, uh, Soviet Russia. So, the, so that was where he was headed to. Um, um, but of course, you know, uh, uh, um, for large parts of Indian history, uh, there has been been people who have denied that he died at all. You know, he right. he did occupy this mind, uh, this space of this great lost leader who will return. Or um, that he was assassinated and all that he was assassinated and killed by Dwala and Yeah, 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 that that, 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 uh, that kind of stuff. Yeah, oh, yeah. Um, you, <laughs> I mean, it's only ten. Well, just just still fifteen years ago. Fifteen years ago, yeah, that you had the last commission trying to explore what really happened to the Vast and the Bills. I mean, everyone knows what happened to him. Uh, there's a garden in Japan that has his ashes. Yeah, I mean, it's, 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 there's no real, there's no real doubt. But I think th that kind of thought, yeah, that led to the and the Bills is also there in a broader sense, yeah, in aspects of the Indian Army. Um, I mean, bear in mind that the INA has genesis not. In through Sabas Bose, Sabas Bose was still in Europe at the time. You initially tried to create an army among uh, Indian PWs captured uh, by the Italians and yeah. by the Germans. Uh, so there was um, a thing called the Free Corps in the end. Um, That's right, yeah, yeah. Which became an SS battalion, yeah. It didn't do much, but um, there's a but just one there. battalion. I mean, you know, they were there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, yeah, they existed, yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, uh, so, so it's what British intelligence called the HIFs, the Hun influenced Indian forces, uh, as opposed to the JIFs, the Jap influenced Jeff, Jeff. <laughs> Indian forces. Um, uh, again, you know, there's not tremendous wit when it comes to British intelligence, but they are. Um, but um, it's amusing enough, I suppose. Um, but just moving, moving back to kind of something we were touching on a, a little while ago about this, this idea of the part they played in defeating the Imperial Japanese. I mean, do you think? Do you think? You know, it's the distance of time. Do you think that's something that people might in India might start to get more interested in, or do you do you think it's just gone, gone forever now? I mean, do you think it's just so distant now and so unheard of and so un non discussed and that and irrelevant that it's that it's that it's or or is there a part where where you know some you can see sort of people getting more interested in that again because it's not irrelevant because because it does. Presage independence. I mean, it, it absolutely does. I think there's there's a few things that mitigate against this. Um, one is um, in a historical sense, it's a problem of partition, really. That that partition memory clouds out here. Um, because how can you how can you be standing shoulder to shoulder with people who are you're then having partition with in civil it, war? It, it, 
is that also I think, but but it's because when you're having the tragedy of genocide, when you're having the largest forced mobilization of peoples in history, there's a, this teleology in place you know, where, where you're kind of looking yeah, yeah, for antecedents. Yeah. And, and it's just what so, was and that's such a huge um, thing that it just dwarfs what came yeah. before. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, 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 so that's part of the problem. The other is sort of kind of geostrategic now as well. That it's not politic for India to kind of uh, 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 look in that way in Japan because um, your Japan is seen as for India uh, as an important ally to help uh, deal with the Chinese problem. So, so, it, so, 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 so it is this kind of a different kind of geostrategic reason as to why you're unlikely to have that kind of. Um, I think mass state backed sort of public uh, recognition of this. But, but that's kind of analogous within with the because after all the Second World War in the UK is it's more it's a more recent phenomenon that 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 that, that it's come back into sort of historical yeah. cultural importance, isn't it? In the fifties and sixties, people are trying to put it behind them, and they have to for all sorts of reasons because it, obviously it's. It's fresh. It's just happened. They want to move on, but also you've got to accommodate Germany or the West Germany in the new in the new global order in Europe. That 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 the, there's a strategic question there too. So, so mm. I mean, it's interesting how many sort of strangely analog things there are because after all, Britain Britain's relationship with the empire is forced through change by the Second World War, and you go from the start of the war where we talk about an imperial effort, the end of the war. You've got governments framing manifestos nationally, and Empire Day is quietly mothballed. You know that 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 similar in a weird way, similar things are happening. It's the, it's the sort of shaking off of the imperial. Um, it's the end yeah. of the British Empire for, for for both ends of the British Empire. You know the 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 the, mm. the imperial centre and the and the you know the and India itself and and and. And you know, I think India being threatened is it is such a catalytic thing too, mm. because up to that point, there's soldiers in North Africa until they until India is threatened by the Japanese, they're there essentially mercenary soldiers, mm. aren't they? And then the business of fighting is sort of um, is changed by threat. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, and you can, I mean, you can, I completely understand if you've got Indian soldiers in North Africa saying, "What on earth are we doing here?" Because it's full of British soldiers saying, "What on earth are we doing here?" You know. Hmm. Yeah, everyone's like, what are we everyone, doing? everyone in North Africa is wondering why on earth they're there. I mean, the Germans included, I imagine. Also, I think it's, it's also about the mobilization of sectors of Indian society in ways that hadn't necessarily mobilized. Like a town like Karachi, for instance, yeah, becomes a cityscape in a few years, uh, a massive naval base. Yeah. Um, that kind of massive fillip yeah, to Indian industrialists, yeah, the creation of massive uh, industrial conglomerates, because it's needed here. Yeah. Uh, the transformation of Calcutta, for instance, yeah, the, the effect of bombing, the the, the 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 that thing of mobilizing women, yeah, particularly when it comes to uh, area wardens. I think there is the, the fact that you're having necessity to uh, you're having a, a Polish Jews turn up here yeah, as refugees, yeah, you need to house them, yeah, or Italian prisoners of war, yeah. <laughs> right? there, there, there is a sort of massive um, mobilization of segments of society that were that were often just left untouched up to Second World War, particularly by a colonial state didn't necessarily want to um, go in certain directions. Um, yes, I, I think I, I think part of the reason in Britain, though, why Second World War wasn't a big thing in the 1560s is that um, there was imperial retrenchment. So yes, you have the loss of South Asia, but there was a, a, a new kind of imperial sensibility in Britain in the 1560s, so yeah, about Middle East, but also particularly about African possessions, so yeah. Britain still had an empire uh, up to the sixties, yeah, up middle of the sixties, yeah. There was still a sense of an imperial place in the world. Really, the Second World War comes in you know, is when the empire is lost. You, know, what was Britain's? What is the purpose of Britain? Yeah. You know? Then Second World War becomes this. Um, I want to say crutch, but um, it, it, it's become it's assumed that kind so it's of sort of lucky talisman, isn't it? It's a t- Lucky, I think so. I think charm so. Charm in a way. Yeah. I, I, I think so, but 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 in but in a way that maybe doesn't have the same currency. Yeah. Uh, so you know, people who talk about Scottish fascism, for instance, have often theorised about uh, it directly having an analogue with the loss of empire. I think there is a sense by which Britain as Britain becomes a problematic kind of concept here when empire's not there anymore. That yes, you can have the war, I suppose, but then even if people talk about the war, focus on the war, think about the war, 
you're getting to a stage now where anyone who's involved in that war is now invisible. And for people who are, uh, I just say, uh, younger than us, the idea of talking to someone who was involved in that conflict you, is no longer there anymore. And, and I, I, do want, I do think that has a big effect here, uh, that if you can't reach out to someone who was there, then is it a big thing? <laughs> I don't know. Gosh, so, oh, this is all absolutely, absolutely fascinating. Um, yeah, it really uh, is. It really is. It, it, uh, it, it is. There's a lot to think about there. There's a hell of a lot to think about to di- well, to digest. Yeah. Well, come on again if you will, Gajendra. My head's sp- my I'll head's spinning, chat, Gajendra. But... I'm thinking I'm thinking about how this all plugs into because I mean, uh, in recent years, I've read. You know, uh, um, Jim and I have talked about this a lot about about you know the the relationship between the the, the ordinary serviceman and his service and. The things that mobilise him, and you know, the 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 and Jonathan Fennell's written brilliantly about it in yes. his book about you know he's he's looked at the census archives as well. Mm, you mm. know, the plot plotting morale and and then the things that are done for morale. Mm. But the and you know and and how you have different you know m- mutinies in New Zealand and uh, you know the zombie mutiny in Canada and all sort of stuff, plotting all that, which is I mean. I'm loath to say an untold story of the Second World War because people say that all the time. But, but that that that, that dimension. But then to add in the uh, to, to begin to peel the onion of what the Indian dimension is in this mm. is is really really interesting. I think the only thing I'd say is that I think it is very important to recognise the human nature of these soldiers. See? And I think that also their age as well. And that yes, as slightly older men, we, we kind of tend to sort of impart very serious concerns to these soldiers. Yeah, war was boring. And the kind of thing that soldiers sort of talk about are bloody stupid, right? Um, yeah, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Um, there's a paper, the paper, the main sort of paper for to pep up Indian soldiers' morale is called for the uh, the um, um, uh, the army newspaper, and um, um, the stories it runs are just absurd, right? About a, a two-headed cow being born in the village, this kind of sort of, uh, this sort of tabloid right. story that is, is stupid. Um, <laughs> even when you're getting into like why people enlist in the INA or enlist in the first place, they, they are absurd stories. But then, you know, when we were 16, 17, we also did stupid things. I was always quite interested in just trying to recover that level of banal humanity sometimes as well. Um, yeah. Uh, innocence, in a way, is it, the yeah. it's the thing, isn't it? Yeah, uh, I, I think I think they were boys, right? Uh, I, I think that um, it's important to sort of cling to that sometimes. Yeah, when we um, we think about these soldiers. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, Jim. thank it's you. Absolutely, absolutely fascinating. We should get you get you back on. Um, maybe gather some questions from some of our listeners and fire those at you if you're, if you're up for that. Sure. Sure. Brilliant. Absolutely fantastic. Well, yeah, thanks well, thank everybody for much. listening. Um, uh, we've been talking to Gajendra Singh. Um, uh, thank you so much. And uh, we'll see you all again soon. Thanks for listening. Bye-bye. Cheerio.